You would quite agree that the song that most Nigerians have been singing lately has been regarding the 2019 general elections. And today, we're not far from it, we would be discussing the 2019 general elections. But on a broader note, how ready are the political parties that have emerged so far? I'm Eunice Johnson, and my guest is Anna Yo Ekanya, but you get to meet him right after the break. Stay tuned. You're still watching the program is issues of the moment and today we will be discussing the 2019 general elections and the readiness of the political parties like i said before we went on the break my guest is anayo ekanya he is a coordinator at Tiku obi youth stallions with the hashtag i stand with atiku he also is the publicity secretary to atiku reloaded group so you see he's really articulated you're welcome mm, thank you very much <laughs> Pleasure, Pleasure okay much. so basically we're talking about the readiness of political parties regarding the 2019 general elections now do you think that we, we would go to the political parties but maybe we should start off with INEC, which of course is the body that regulates and would coordinate the whole uh, process. So how would you say that INEC is actually ready? Would you say they are really ready uh, for what we expect in come 2019? Uh, thank you very much, Eunice. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, well, INEC um, issue has been uh, uh, floating recently, uh, especially with the uh, uh, issue of the electoral bill not being passed by the, uh, by the president. The truth of the matter, not being signed by the president, the truth of the matter is that INEC will always tell you they are ready. You're not going to dispute that. And because they tell you they are ready, you're not the one who is doing the operational activities. You're going to believe them. But how you measure the reality of that answer is the result of the previous elections they've conducted. Okay, of course there are improvements, um, even international um, bodies uh, applauded certain improvements in their processes. But that does not tell you they are fully ready for the bigger election coming up in 2019. When we're talking about ready, we're talking in, ready in terms of operations, in terms of the card reader, in terms of um, PVCs and all that. A lot of people have not collected their PVCs. Some, I, mean, I don't think even uh, all of them have all been printed. Most people are still carrying them um, temporary PVCs. I make themselves, even though they claim they are ready, we'll see what happened in Oshun. There are a lot of complaints, a lot of issues, and you could even hear recently PDP uh, uh, national chairman calling for resignation of the of INEC. It, th th these are worrisome issues. I mean, if, if all the opposing parties are not comfortable, if they feel that the the the, the umpire uh, body or INEC is not ready, you have to show them that you're ready. You have to give them the confidence that the election is going to be credible. A lot of things have to be ready. It's not just saying that we are ready. You remember then, the guy was saying he was ready and ready, even when a lot of people had not collected PVCs. That was in 2015. So the same way we're coming in now, they're saying they are ready. Okay, for instance, the electoral bill, which the president refused to assent to, part of the um, uh, part of the um, uh, INEC budget that was passed by the National Assembly recently, which created a lot of a lot of um, chaos already. Major, the major part of that uh, that huge amount, more than 200 million approved for, uh, for um, 200 billion approved for INEC, is the. Uh, 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 the, uh, the the card reader issue. Okay. So the, you see what I'm where I'm going right now. So at the end of the day, probably they've budgeted a lot of these things, a lot of money to be spent on this. Now the bill has not been passed, making it not very mandatory for the card reader issue. So you, uh, is it neither here or there for you to okay. say whether well, INEC is ready or not. Or not. But we will get to that of the bill, the the electoral uh, acts and its amendments and all of that. But you would you mentioned um, 2015 where some card readers weren't ready and even at that time the then an um, INEC. INEC chairman Jaga was insisting was ready. they were ready. Exactly. But you would you might not uh, disagree with the fact that they actually proved they were because following the way the whole elections were conducted back then 
that we even had some African countries seek their help to come and, you know, direct them on how they were able to successfully run the election. Do you see that playing out again? Like they might not appear to be ready, but when the time comes, they might actually deliver. Do you think that is what is replaying? If you want to compare Nigeria with smaller African countries, it's not, it's, 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 it's not, I mean, it's not sustainable. These are smaller countries. Of course, whatever Nigeria brings out is, should be a template for smaller countries. Even though that we are not really setting the pace as we are supposed to be as a leading nation in the whole of uh, Africa. So for people to copy what we do, it's not, it shouldn't be nothing, anything new to us. But you have to understand that we're a big country in terms of population in many aspects. So if you if say you're ready, the readiness should, 60% uh, of the people should believe you're ready. It's not just a certain group of people believing you're ready, and you saying you're ready. At the end of the day, there'll be failures. Remember that particular day, the, 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 the former president, Jonathan, he's on his own polling booth. He could, his card reader failed. He could not be identified through the card reader. Even though that he's a man, uh, a pure Democrat, he would have called for cancellation of the whole issue. So even Diana had said they were ready, they were ready, they were ready. At this, the polling booth of the number one citizen, he, he, he was not well, um, the accreditation was not done with card reader. So you see the issue. So of course there will always be there will be some plaudible uh, aspects of INEC. It's not going to take it away. Like I said, even in Osho, some of the international observers applauded them for certain areas they've improved. There's no doubt about it. But being ready for the real, real main issue, the main election 2019, that involves all the 36 states, well, only God knows if they are ready. Okay, so you're actually saying that even though they seem to have tried, but absolutely. then there's still Improve. room for improvement. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, now let's talk about that bill, the Electoral Act Amendment. You know, the president, uh, even though he had refused to assent to the, bill. to the bill, he gave seemingly credible reasons, which, you know, was basically that it wasn't within the normal stipulated amount once it's beneath six months then it's not you know based on ECOWAS and based on all of that and all that so what does this refusal to sign this bill portend for nigeria okay this is a very topical question you see the card reader issue even though i could decide to use card reader he does not have a legal framework back in it that is the issue the card reader has. That's why even when, like I referred to Jonathan Owen failed, it, the election was not contested. Because legally, the, the law, the electoral law that is floating right now, which we are, we, are, we, are, we are hanging upon now, does not mandate the card reader for the election. You could use it. It does not mandate it. So the president refusing to cite this electoral law, now, which mandates the uh, card reader, it now negates the fact that you cannot oh, seek redress in court of law for reasons of card reader. So the court will not grant you any, uh, any, uh, any, your injunction just because it said, oh, the card reader failed in my own unit or during the election, certain people were, vote, were allowed to vote without card reader. So you cannot seek redress because the law has no reference point. There's no legal backing for it. So that is the implication. The implication is that people could be used to vote. Anybody can vote and anything could be manufactured. Votes could be manufactured. And you cannot fully have a database which is bound to you to use as a, as a, a template to regulate it, which is the card reader. So now, you, so there's no way you're going to say, oh, this person is not supposed to vote or he wasn't the right person to, to vote because the card reader was not used. Anybody can carry anybody's PVC and go there and claim to vote. Even the underage voters, anybody can go and vote and come and come straight and claim I've won the election. But if you insist, if the card reader, if the electoral bill had been ascended by the president, you would have mandated INEC to make sure card reader must be used in every polling booth. So they have to ensure that it works. If it doesn't work, that already nullifies that particular polling booth. Okay, but are you saying that to, to a large extent, drawn from what you're saying, that um, the refusal to sign or to assent to the bill would affect the credibility of the community? Absolutely. Elections? It keeps the whole thing open, debatable in court of law. So at the end of the day, if um, certain areas, they don't use card reader, anything happens, they are malpractices. Oh, different people using different cards and underage voters and all that. There's no way you can prove it before the court of law. So the only way you can prove this thing is through the card reader. So if the court cannot say, okay, fine, the court will only base on the legal framework they have available. They're not going to base on hearsay or based on 
stories or whatever. Okay, what does the law say? The law says card reader could be used, but it's not mandatory, it's not compulsory that it must be used for election. It shouldn't be that it must not be used as a template for that. That means people seeking redress after the election cannot base that be used the card reader as a basis for their uh, uh, for their uh, uh, this from court. The court will not be able to grant to, their to request. Even, okay, but but then if it is so important and you know like I said earlier, one of the reasons, or which is actually the major reason the president gave us that the six months gap and all of that. Why wasn't? Why didn't they push for it before it got to that point? Because they already knew the law. Oh, remember, uh, sorry for pausing you, Eunice. This bill, this is the fourth time it's been refused by the president. Yes, it is agreed. But why is it now that it is like an issue? Why didn't they fight for it then and make sure that okay? So why now? If it had been refused then and they went to sleep, assumed they went to sleep about it. Why are you bringing it if you know that it was refused when? It originally was, you know, um, acceptable to present it. What is the guarantee that you are bringing it within six months and it will now be approved? Yeah, well, when the con constitution or the law actually negates that, what 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 guarantee do you have? Okay. If it has been brought several times before now, it wasn't approved. Is it now that it will? Oh, 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 the, 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 the facts of the case is that there were the prison put down certain issues why he refused the assent earlier. In every state, when a president refuses assent on a bill, he has he to state the reasons. reasons. So he gave the reasons, which then went back and worked on. And remember, this happened when they were on recess, when nationalism was on recess. So they went back and worked on those when they came back, the regime from recess, and worked on those uh, issues. And they represented it to the president because of the importance of the bill to, uh, for a credible election. And according to uh, uh, for, um, um, uh, APC leader Lawan, they was actually the executive, the president, that actually pushed the bill and put in uh, the card reader issue. I'm quoting them uh, now and now. So what I'm trying to say is that at the end of the day, they, the National Assembly worked on it based on issues raised by the president. And of course, I mean, before they could finish all that, they, these are processes they mm -hmm. have to complete. When the processes are, are completed and the, the, the House fully passes, the, nation, the Senate fully passes it, then they will represent back to the president for his assent. And that is what they've duly followed. And I don't think our own law stops it. It's just the ECOWAS law that says you should be more than, no, no more than six months. And it's even debatable. There are a lot of clauses there that will also give room for uh, manipulations and all so that. So which is more binding now, the ECOWAS law or ours? Of course, which ours will be number one binding on us. I mean, I mean, so that means it's actually questionable. It's still something that could be. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So that's what I'm saying. The, the, the six months issue, which is based on ECOWAS, um, mm. this is, is not enough to, to refuse, refuse the assent. So, and even because even if you sign it, that will not negate the signature. You understand what I'm mm -hmm. trying to say? Mm -hmm. So it will not stop the validity of your, of your assent to the bill. Okay. <laughs> okay, this is getting really interesting, but let's take a quick break and when we return, the conversation would continue. Don't go away. Thank you very much for staying tuned. The program is still Issues of the Moment, and we've been talking about the 2019 general elections. How prepared are the parties and, of course, the candidates representing the parties? My guest has been Anayo Ekaya. He is a coordinator at Tiku Obi Youth Stallions with the hashtag I Stand With Atiku, and also the publicity secretary to Atiku Reloaded Group. So, um, moving on. Now, your group, what is the mandate of your group? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you see, during 2015, 2014, 2015, when PDP was um, preparing for elections, we, most of us, because I, I have I've participated in elections both in Nigeria and abroad, in Canada precisely. So when we told PDP about the issue of um, social media, they didn't take it seriously until it became late. So this time around, I, of course I participated then, this time around we all we came early to remind them that social media is going to be critical to this campaign. So our group is mainly a social media campaign group with all, in all the play, all platforms, Facebook, Twitter, uh, WhatsApp and all that, to be able to push the fact that we need, uh, uh, we need, uh, 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 
we, we need to elect a president who has interest of Nigerians at heart, a president that will, whose major cardinal points are going to really, really reflect on our lives in terms of economy. We talked about his plan, economy is very critical, poverty eradication is very critical, and a, a restructuring our country, which is very, very important. Every region talks about restructuring today, except only one region that has not pushed it up. Every other region, out of the six regions, they're all calling for restructuring. And of course, Atiku has also told, said he's going to privatize all the almighty NNPC, which has not been able to give us any, uh, and uh, has not been has not been anything but transparency in all this all this while. These, no, the, their books are not transparent. We don't know what happens there, and we cannot continue to carry a big burden, a big a nation like this. Most other uh, oil producing countries do not have um, uh, uh, a, a building like NNPC. These things are all privatized, living in the hands of uh, uh, private uh, private sector, where the expertise comes in, transparency comes in, accountability comes in, productivity comes in, and of course profitability. And we will generate more revenue. This is our number one revenue uh, source. So we cannot continue to live in the hands of government. With all the secrecy going on there every year, we have issues and fraud and fraud. The books are not accessible. and. It, too many of it. So well, there's need for us to push a candidate who is ready, ready to rescue our nation. People are hungry, the youths are crying. Just go, walk on the street and do an open uh, survey and ask people, do polls. I mean, the reflection, you, you walk on the street, sit down and see people walking. You walk on the street, you see an old, big, grown-up man begging you for one naira for transport. You, you feel for the person. He doesn't want to beg. There's no job for him. If you give him a job, he's not going to beg you. Yeah, but how many you leave him and walk down there? One woman is begging you. And you so, feel so bad in your heart. Like, probably you don't even have your... So they, they, they look at you, maybe you're wearing suit coming back from work. You don't even have a naira in your pocket. And when you look at that woman carrying the baby begging you, you're, you're melting inside. People are hungry. There's poverty in the land. We have to rescue our nation. So that is why what prompted the issue. All the youth say, okay, we have to push up a candidate that is ready, ready to rescue us, save us from these um, precipices. Because uh, before we we're, uh, were already number one uh, trending country in poverty, the whole world, number one, the poverty capital, the whole world. What more do we want to be? <laughs> that, that's the worst. I mean, nothing worse than that, actually. You, you just mentioned that all the youth, like you guys, got, you, the youth gathered to like support. What happened to the not too young to run bill? Why didn't you go for a young candidate? Why? Um, Cool. It, that's beautiful, but you have to understand our political landscape. Our political structure makes it difficult for a young person to get to that ladder. It doesn't mean that we don't, we, 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 we don't I mean, I'm a young person, uh, 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 the, uh, the, the, the um, uh, Macron, is, I don't think he's up to 40 years old. So, but at the end of the day, when you look at the scenario, and analyzing, you ask yourself, if actually we're pushing this young person, will they get the votes to defeat the incumbent? That is a major question. What happened to giving it a try? Hey, <laughs> this is not time for trial, I have to mm. remind you. Our nation is at a precipice. If we do not get it right now, we, we, we might plunge deeper into the, uh, into the uh, uh, this thing we're already into. So we, can't, we, we don't want to gamble on that. So we already know that, uh, because, uh, and, and let's know that party, uh, it's not about only about individual. It's not only just by article. But you look at what program does it have? What, what plan exactly? The whole Beautiful. Thing. And then the team is going to build. It's, it doesn't really matter actually who is there. If you can build a strong team that will that will drive. Sometimes your, your, the team your is actually what drives. Beautiful. It's a team. So it's not even. So the age might not be anything really. If you could build a, a good team that recognizes also the role of the youth, the role of women, and the impact of this century, people who are actually 21st century driven, that will help you put your programs and policies in line with what the, uh, the century calls for. So it, it doesn't matter who is there. So it, the reason why we are, we, are, we, are, we are struggling with age, look at Trump. Trump is more than 70 years old. But he is, <laughs> he's not an analog person. Trump is, <laughs> do you understand what I'm trying to say? So it's not about the age. It's about who can bring people together, have policies, push those policies to be implemented, drive the process to make sure there's a result at the end of the day that will impact on the common man, even in, uh, at the smallest level, even in my village. Okay, so how prepared would you say the Yatiku campaign is for the 2019 elections? Absolutely, the campaign is, is ready. In fact, Nigerians are more ready than even uh, everyone. <laughs> so the campaign is ready because for long, like I said, we, we, you, when you walk by the street, people you could hear people telling, seeking for... Uh, uh, 
someone could come and rescue rescue us. So from the beginning, our Tiku campaign knows that there is a big burden, there's a big trust on the campaign by the people to rescue them, to come on board and bring changes. So we're working 24 hours. As I'm talking to you right now, there are meetings going on here and there. People are working 24 hours to make sure that it's not just waking up to say you want power. You have a well-structured plan, a template, a well-structured roadmap to rescue our nation. So we are ready. And that's why if you take a time to read even the article plan, you will see a lot of policies. And are many things are coming up. talking about the 64 page, 63? Yes. Page? Yeah. Even me, I've not taken time to read it. I must be frank with you. But, it, but most of the silent points you can see there, like I talked about economy, privatization, restructuring. These are things that are issues that are on, on everyone's lips. Issues that will take us out of, uh, that, will, that will actually bring a paradigm shift to governance in Nigeria. Okay, so what would you say is the expectation or are the expectations of Nigerians regarding the forthcoming elections? Well, of course, Nigerians want someone who at the end of the day, by the time he's elected in government, the next day will bring issues, I mean, implement policies that will change their fortunes. Like I said earlier, people are hungry, there's no job. Economy is very critical. There's nobody who wants to run in any election in Nigeria that doesn't have a strong uh, plan for economy that will, will make impact in Nigeria. No matter what you promise them, and it doesn't make sense if people cannot find food to eat. It doesn't make sense if a young man is grown after school, he doesn't have a job. It doesn't make sense if a man is walking on the street begging for one era. You feel bad. You think he's a beggar. No one loves to be a beggar. Just because he doesn't have and there's no job for him and all that. So Nigerians want to see a rescue plan that will, the moment it is announced that this is the president of the nation and there's a plan, well-structured plan to rescue the nation that will begin to make impact right away with a whole, uh, a whole team set up and start work right without any, any delay. So that six months down the line, one year down the line, they're feeling the impact on our nation. It's very critical. And that is, that, that's what Nigerians want. And we are ready for that. Okay, now having seen, you know, we have so many presidential candidates that have emerged this time and their emergence is like, it's really thrilling because you, you just see one and before you close your eyes and open it, you've seen the other and so many just keep coming up. Now, do you think these people have the wherewithal to actually um, run this race? In, uh, for someone to wake up and say he wants to be president of the country like Nigeria, I, I, I don't think you, 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 you think it doesn't, it doesn't know what it takes. Like I said, uh, the Macron, if you saw him yesterday, you wouldn't think he would be uh, um, a French president today. So if someone wakes up and says uh, he wants to contest, he should have done his homework for sure. I believe most of them, have, a lot of young people there are very good. Like the Moalos and all of them, they are, these are seasoned professionals. You understand? But like I said, you, uh, uh, the, 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 the stage where we are now, we need someone who will be able to, because he's not, um, I, there's something my boss used to tell me, he said, attitude with, I mean, latitude, latitude without um, altitude, uh, without um, your altitude. I'm trying to say that if you actually have it here in the brain, you still have to have it the other side. So meaning that if you, most of them are professional seasoned who will make impact. But if you don't have the followership to win the election, it's a problem. So you, but you will not take it away that they know what to do or they could actually bring change. And most of them are young people who are 21st century driven. And hey, they will actually be able to drive. But then Nigeria is a very big country with a very complex uh, 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 dynamics. So for you to be able to step into a big shoe of Nigeria, like, you have to have the heart to be able to carry everybody along. You have to have the resources. Because in our own part of the world, the money is very critical in elections. It's not like um, in civilized nations like U.S., maybe there are limits how much could be spent. Someone like Obama maybe never spent one naira and became president. It just, it just through mobilization. People were donating money to him, one dollar, two dollar, the whole nation. But because of the poverty, if you're calling for donations, people are not going to give you one naira. So you, you have to have the resources also. So even when you have the technical acumen, the professionalism, the knowledge to be able to do something, make an impact, you have to have the for resources to carry people along. You also have to have the broad appeal to everyone. So people will be able to say, oh, even though you're a young person, doesn't mean that everybody's mm -hmm. going to buy you. There are young people who are even more polarized, more, more, more uh, uh, ethnocentric than, other, than even older people. Do you understand? So a lot of things, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of things will come into. Yes. Come okay. Into. Maybe they are qualified enough. Maybe they aren't. Who even knows who is qualified enough at the end of, uh, of the whole thing? Now, 
everybody has been talking about the 2019 general elections. I remember back then in 2015 when we were, even before then, when we were looking forward to the elections then, yeah. it was like, oh my God, what's it going to look like and all of that. So now we're looking forward to 2019. What picture do you have in mind of the elections? I mean, we, nobody can predict, but what picture do you have in mind? Well, I, for me, I believe um, the election is going to witness a lot of, um, uh, a lot of, um, a large turnout. People are going to come out to vote. People are really disenchanted, so they want to prove it through the ballot box. Uh, so it's that is very critical. Uh, we, of course, you're not going to take away of having skirmishes, having crises in some parts of the country. The U.S. has already won that certain states will witness crisis in the election, and these are based on on, 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 on data they collected. So you wouldn't take that away because uh, in, in our climes, election is a do-or-die affair. People do not want to go like that. They don't want to give up power like that. And unfortunately, we're not like the civilized nation where you just leave it with the people to decide. If they don't want you, you walk home without them. In our system, you know how it is. So it's going to be very con highly contested. There are a lot of large turnout of people to prove, uh, uh, to cast their vote because people are realizing now that votes count. Even, even though there are some states where we feel their votes have not counted, some recent elections, that's fine. People, st people still believe what happened in 2015, that they could still decide who will become their president come 2019. Okay. <laughs> that's a good one. It's actually good to know that Nigerians still believe that their vote counts. My guest has been Anayo Ekenya. We've been talking about the 2019 general elections and the readiness of political parties and their candidates. Thank you very much for being part of the program. My pleasure, Eunice. Thanks so much. I remain your host, Eunice Johnson. Till next time, join us again. For now, we say goodbye.